Okay, in this video we're going to be talking about the haliform reaction. This is a re reaction that involves a methyl ketone, so you have to have a ketone where one side is a methyl group. Upon treatment with a halogen, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, and base, followed by an H plus workup, we're going to get out a carboxylic acid. So what we should notice here is that this methyl group here is lost on the main carbon chain and that's replaced with an OH. So we're breaking a carbon-carbon bond in this reaction and in fact this is the carbon-carbon bond we're breaking to produce a new carbon-oxygen bond and that carbon that we've lost is forming what we call a haliform and that's the generic term we use when we're talking about different halogens here. So if that was chlorine, it would be chloroform, bromine, bromoform, or iodine, that would be iodoform. So again, in this reaction, you simply take a methyl ketone, treat it with X2 sodium hydroxide followed by H plus workup, and you get out a carboxylic acid and then your haliform. This reaction is a little difficult, it's a little tricky to recognize, um, and what you have to remember is to keep in mind it has to be a methyl ketone upon treatment of X2 and sodium hydroxide. All right, so let's look at a specific example and then work through the mechanism. So again, identifying the reaction is the hardest part. Once you identify that you're doing the haliform reaction, it's it's pretty easy to um, to draw the products here and clearly again we have a methyl ketone treat this with Br2 sodium hydroxide followed by H plus and then the product that we're going to get out is obviously benzoic acid so let's draw in our product here And again, the bond I just drew used to be a carbon-carbon bond. Now it's bound to an oxygen. And then we want to include the haliform that we form here. In this case, we're forming bromoform, bromoform CHBr3. Okay, so that is the product that we make. So now let's go through the mechanism so we can understand why this process is happening. All right, so going through the mechanism, we see we treat this with bromine and sodium hydroxide. So first, let's draw in our hydrogens on our methyl ketone. Obviously, we have three hydrogens here. I'm going to draw those in now. And then upon treatment with sodium hydroxide, what we need to remember about sodium hydroxide and really anything with a lone pair is this species is always in competition acting as a base versus a nucleophile and this is a problem students generally have understanding the difference between those and when is sodium hydroxide a base and when is it an electrophile in this problem we know that the carbon of the carbonyl is partial positive so it could act as a nucleophile but we also understand that we have acidic hydrogens here on the alpha carbon and in this example, sodium hydroxide is going to act as both a base and a nucleophile. And that's what makes this reaction very interesting. So if sodium hydroxide acted as a nucleophile, the only thing it could attack was the carbon of the carbonyl. And upon treatment of base, an aldehyde or a ketone, that's not going to give you a viable product. Um, so while you could attack here, that reaction is reversible and you wouldn't get a product from that reaction. So sodium hydroxide is in fact going to act as a base and we're going to deprotonate one of the acidic hydrogens on the alpha carbon. So I'm breaking that bond and let's draw the intermediate we get from that reaction. Again, we still have our benzene ring, our phenyl group. Sorry, 
didn't give myself enough space. And now we've lost one of those hydrogens, so we only have two hydrogens on the alpha carbon on the right, and therefore we have a lone pair and a negative charge on that species. And the species we just created is called an enolate, and there's always a good resonance structure we can draw with that. So let's draw that resonance structure now. So what I'm going to do, instead of having to redraw the benzene ring a bunch of times, I'm just going to abbreviate it with pH. And pH just stands for a benzene ring. And remember when we draw an enolate, there's a good resonance structure we can draw where the double bond is between the carbon-carbon bond and then the oxygen has the extra lone pair and the negative charge. All right, so together, these two resonance structures represent an enolate. And we should remember that an enolate is a very good nucleophile. So this species here is a great nucleophile. And typically, these reactions happen at the alpha carbon. So the nucleophilic position is on the carbon the alpha carbon, not on the oxygen. So in step one, we've done a deprotonation step to form an enolate, which is a great nucleophile. Now what we need to do is try to identify the electrophile. And in this case, our electrophile is bromine. So we can draw in bromine. And understand that that is electrophilic. So just like we learned alkenes can attack bromine, well, so can enolates. So I'm going to draw in my arrows here from either resonance structures. You can have the lone pair on the O come down to form the carbon-oxygen double bond, which forces the alkene, really the enolate, to attack the Br and break the bromine bond. Conversely, you could just come from the carbon to attack the bromine and then again break that bromine-bromine bond. So you can do either one of these from either resonance structure. So I'm just going to write an OR here. Typic typically if you're asked to do this mechanism you just need to draw it from one of those resonance structures. And now let's take a look at the new intermediate that we formed. So again I'm going to abbreviate my benzene ring with pH and now I've replaced one of the hydrogens with uh, bromine that we will draw in green. So this is the new product that we formed. What's interesting about this reaction is these two hydrogens are now more acidic. Because of the inductive effect, bromine is more electronegative than your typical hydrogen here. These two hydrogens are now more acidic than the three hydrogens that we started with. So once I make one equivalent of this intermediate, sodium hydroxide is again going to act as a base. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to deprotonate a hydrogen again. So here's my deep protonation step. Again, we're going to be forming an enolate. And there's the enolate that we form. So basically what we're saying is that this enolate is more stable than this enolate because this has one bromine attached to it 
which stabilizes this negative charge by the inductive effect. Again, we can draw a resonance structure for this enolate. So let's do that here. And in the resonance structure of the enolate, we now have a carbon-carbon bond still connected to the H, still connected to the bromine, and that oxygen has that oxygen has that extra lone pair and the negative charge. So again, we created an, another, our second enolate here, which is of course still a good nu nucleophile. So I'm just going to call these structures enolate number two. And in this case, again, we're looking for a electrophile. And again, we still have Br2 floating around in solution. So the enolate is going to do exactly the same thing that the first enolate did. And we're going to attack Br2. So let's draw our product again. In this case we now have one hydrogen and two bromines. So if you think about this, now we have two bromines here which makes this hydrogen more acidic than this intermediate and much more acidic than that intermediate. So the same exact reaction happens again. So in this case I'm not going to draw the arrows, I'm just going to draw kind of two arrows indicating that the same thing happens again. We do a deprotonation step to form an enolate. That enolate attacks Br2 again until we get To the following species, our tribrominated methyl ketone. And here's where things get interesting, and the role of sodium hydroxide now changes. So I'm going to draw this in red here. So again, we have sodium hydroxide in solution. And now sodium hydroxide is going to act as a nucleophile and attack the carbon of the carbonyl. That gives us our tetrahedral intermediate. So we have three lone pairs around that oxygen. We still have our carbon that's connected to three bromines in our new carbon-oxygen bond I'm showing in red. The key part of this reaction is normally carbons are not leaving groups. So oxygen attacking any of these carbonyls before this step is not a productive step. But in this case, because we have three bromines on the adjacent alpha carbon, those three bromines, because they're so electronegative, are now able to stabilize a negative charge on the carbon. So watch what happens, is this lone pair can come down and break that carbon-carbon bond.
and that leaves us with our carbonyl intact but now connected to our carboxylic acid plus we now have our haloform in solution which has a negative charge. So essentially what happens because these bromines are so electronegative they can stabilize an extra lone pair and a negative charge on this carbon. Now we're not done with the reaction because I've just generated a negative species in the presence of a carboxylic acid which is of course acidic so let's just erase this here so we can draw out our oxygen hydrogen bond and what happens is that lone pair is going to steal that hydrogen to form haloform so we've now created this final product here bromoform and we have our carboxylate species as well. So this is the product we get after step one and you'll see why we need to have step two where we add acid because we need to protonate our carboxylate to get the carboxylic acid. So let's just show that step here and what we're simply going to do is protonate our carboxylate using H plus that's found in step two and that gives us our final product of our carboxylic acid. So just to review this full mechanism sodium hydroxide acts as a base to deprotonate the hydrogen on the alpha carbon forming an enolate intermediate. This enolate is a good nucleophile and attacks the electrophile Br2 which gets us this alpha brominated ketone. That step, these hydrogens are now more acidic because of the inductive effect from the bromine. So our base will deprotonate here again to form enolate 2, which forms our dibrominated alpha carbon. And that those two steps happen exactly again. We deprotonate and attack to form the tribrominated methyl ketone. Here's where sodium hydroxide acts as a, bit, as a nucleophile attacking the carbon of the carbonyl to give us our tetrahedral intermediate. This lone pair can come back down, break this carbon-carbon bond, giving us our anion of bromoform and our carboxylic acid. The anion of bromoform will deprotonate our carboxylic acid to form the carboxylate, and that's the final product we get after step one. Of course, we generally don't want a salt here, so we add acid or work up with acid in step two to put the hydrogen back onto the carboxylate to form the carboxylic acid and bromoform. Okay, so for class, what I'd like you to do is just solve this problem. It's very simple, exactly the same thing we saw before. And I want you to draw both products. I want you to draw the um, the the main product we get from the reaction from the ketone and then also draw the halo form. So both draw both two products and then bring this into class.